Lear is the name. Call me King. My father changed our name when I was young, and Lear was what he changed it to from Lerner. But rich boys of a certain class at school weren't fooled. They called me King to show me that they knew. They bowed when I went past, and then they called, Here, King! Here, boy! <laughs> and laughed when I went by, looked up. I had to laugh on them. I took the ball and ran with it. I acted very cool. But I became polite, impervious, and hid inside the cloak of majesty. I acted like a king. Still, everybody called me king because they thought I liked it. And I did. It helped me deal with life. But now I find that life has dealt with me. What happened? I took off all my clothes outside my daughter's house in Florida for all the world to see. They came and got me. They didn't bother me. I didn't think it mattered. The man I'd been was dead and buried. Gone for good. The VA took me in. A broken man. I spent a lot of time here doing nothing. Obsessing on understanding just what happened. Before I landed here, I was obsessed with projects. Real estate, investments, deals. There's nothing left of that. I've got my GI pension, a place to sleep, three square meals, that's all. And then one day, some guy for a joke gave me this book. He said, hey King, I found this book, it's got your name on it. I'd never read King Lear. Read Shakespeare? I was much too busy being king, you know. I thought I'd read the thing to pass the time. I skimmed the pages, read a line or two, and then I found the spot where Lear says, Which of you shall we say does love us most? What kind of father asks his grown-up kids to publicly display their love for him? What makes him do it? I thought I knew. I said something like that to my own kids. I saw what came from that. And now I saw another father making just the same mistake. The more I read the more I saw myself and I became obsessed with understanding Lear. I mean the both of us. The King and I as we take off our crowns. I knew how hard it was to quit the roles we play become internalized. He wanted to step down and still be king. While we, unburdened, crawl towards death, he says. I wasn't dying. I'd had a mild heart attack and a bypass, and so I thought I'd uh, quit. Before my luck ran out, I looked around and made a plan. <laughs> That's all you have to do to make God laugh. I had 
I have three daughters. The oldest two are married. The youngest lived with me out on Long Island. The kid was like my late wife, very warm. The other two, like me, tend to be cold. There were two guys who buzzed around the youngest. It didn't look like love in bloom to me. I thought that they were fortune hunting brats. I wanted to get rid of them for good. So I worked things out so I could have my way. I thought it was a very clever plan. I'd give each girl an equal share of all our assets and I kept our home out on Long Island for the kid. I thought that if she owned it, she wouldn't move. She wouldn't leave. She wouldn't have to marry anyone and she could say goodbye to those two boys. I had another reason for that scheme. You see, my youngest kept my life alive. When I came home at night, she'd kiss my nose. <laughs> A funny way to welcome me. No matter what the day had brought to me, no matter how I felt, it always made me laugh. I didn't want to lose the life we had. I saw that Lear felt much the way I did. He says, I set my rest on her kind nursery. A very clever pun. The footnote says, to set my rest means that he bet the farm, that he bet everything he had on that outcome, as if his life were like some poker game. Oh. I felt like him. I wanted nothing more than keep her with me. I loved that kid, and then I thought about my other two. I wasn't happy with my oldest girls. They only came to me to ask for things. I got the urge to show them how I felt. I knew my position as their provider would end when I had nothing more to give. One last hurrah! I thought, what better time? I said, you each will get an equal share. But first, we'll have a little contest with a secret prize. Which of you shall we say does love us most? That we, our largest bounty, may extend. I knew damn well who loved me most. I also knew my oldest two would say anything to win a prize. Sir, I love you more than words convey. That's how Lear's oldest daughter starts her speech. Dearer, then eyesight, space, or liberty, beyond what made me reckoned rich or rare, as much as life itself with grace, health, beauty, honor, as much as child ever loved or father found, a love that makes breath poor and speech unable. Beyond all manner of so much, I love you. <coughs> and then her sister, not to be outdone, 
says, I am made of that same substance as my sister and think we feel the same. In my true heart, I find she names identically. My love, only she comes too short. And I profess myself an enemy to all other joys which the deep sense of love can have and find I am alone felicitate in your paternal love. Oh my God. <laughs> Those two girls. <sighs> Mine sounded like a pair of Hallmark cards. As each one finished, I announced what her share would be. I told the oldest that she got the uh, ranch out in Montana and her sister got the compound down in Florida. Well then, they saw my scheme. What's left? Oh, the home out on Long Island. The kid will live in it with me. I was the prize. <laughs> I saw that Leah's scheme mirrored mine. His favorite one would get the castle and her dad and they'd go on living as before. My youngest wouldn't even have to make a speech to win the prize. She'd win it in a breeze. She'd only have to kiss my nose. It was no contest. They knew that. I wanted them to see what we had been. I almost winked at her. And now, our joy, although our last and least, what can you say to take a share more valuable than theirs? I almost winked at her. She said nothing. Nothing, nothing, father. Unhappy that I am, I cannot heave my heart into my mouth. I love you, father, according to our bond, no more, no less. You have begot me, bred me, loved me, and I obey you, love you, honor you. I return these duties as his right fit. Why have my sister's husbands if they say they love you all? The man whose pledge must take my hand will carry with it half my love, half my care and duty. Sure, I shall never marry like my sisters and love my father all. I got the point. I wanted to humiliate her sisters and now I was the one who was ashamed. The blood rushed to my face. I got so hot. I couldn't look at her. I couldn't listen. I couldn't bear to hear the truth. She had no yen to be my full-time nurse. She wanted to get married. Of course she did. It hurt so much because it came as such a shock. I felt a fool, an idiot. My cleverness had kept them warm and comfortable. I never shared with them how hard it was. I never told them when I made mistakes. Uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. Who said that? Well, whoever that guy was, he knew his beans. I couldn't wait to take that damn thing off. But what would I do then, when I retired? Canasta at the home for aged Jews? I wanted her to sail with on the sound. I wanted her to ride with, to take trips. I wanted her to keep my life alive. If only I had had the patience the good sense to wait until the pounding in my ears, the drumming from my heart would stop. But no, 
I couldn't wait. I opened my big mouth. Fuck her, I said. You two, divide her share. And then I saw what I had done. In one rash move, I gave away my home. Like Lear, a victim of my expectations. I could have fixed it, sure I could. I could have said, I'm sorry, I spoke too soon. I take it back. Oh, those words would break my mouth. I knew how damage was controlled. You act as if you meant it and then improvise. You both shall house me. One month at a time. And with me, everything that makes me comfortable, my uh, butler, barber, trainer, chef, and caddy, uh, my chauffeurs with a car or two, my plane. And that includes the uh, pilots and mechanics, too. And uh, while we're at it, I think I'll bring my favorite horses with their trainers. And, of course, that includes the stable boys. You know how hard it is to get good help. <laughs> and why, just because I quit, should they have to lose their jobs? It sounds so snotty when I say it here to you. I sound like those rich kids at school who taunted me. Or like a king. Kings talk like that. Like Lear, when he demands a hundred knights, his daughters must support a hundred knights. Well, I made demands, but what else could I do? Move in with them and live their life? No, sir! I'd show them I was still the boss. Well, they were just as keen to show me the time had passed. The frost was on the pumpkin. My daughter in Montana said, The men you brought with you are insolent. I spend all day in quarrels and complaints. I thought I made it clear to you before and that you'd speak to them. But I'm afraid the truth is that you egg them on. Encourage what I thought you'd stop, and if that's so, you should apologize. Are you my daughter? I wish you had what good sense that you had. You're acting like a child. What is your name? That's exactly what I mean. I'm begging you to understand me clearly and not joke. As you are old and honored, please be wise. You have a staff of 40 serving you. A crew undisciplined and rowdy, mold. Their lack of manners and restraint infects this house. They act as if they're living in some waterfront saloon. They've turned this place into a drunken whorehouse. Can't you see that? It's got to stop. You must get rid of all those rowdies. Cut your crew in half. If you don't do it, then I will. I, I, I wanted to respond to what I knew were gross exaggerations. But somehow, I couldn't. I couldn't point her to the door and say, get out. It was her house. the one I gave her. Oh, 
I felt so vulnerable. I had no strength. I stammered like a kid. It isn't true. <laughs> God, that sounds so lame. I wish I could have said, like Lear, here, nature, here, dear goddess, here. Suspend thy judgment. If thou didst intend to make this creature fruitful, into her womb convey sterility, dry up in her the organs of increase, and from her derogate body never spring a babe to honor her. If she must teem, create her child of spleen, that it may be a thwart disnatured torment to her, stamp wrinkles on her brow of youth with Kate and tears, Fret channels in her cheeks, turn all her pains and joys of motherhood to laughter and contempt, that she may feel how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. But all I said was, it isn't true <laughs> that I bawled just like a kid. Our roles had been reversed and I was now the, the child. I lost the man I was when I was boss. The toughness that I'd learned to wear was gone, cast off with everything that made me tough. Sometimes when men retire, they seem to lose their souls as if they died a little. They sometimes even wonder who they are. Does any here know me? This is not Lear. Does Lear walk thus, talk thus? Where are his eyes? Can anybody tell me who I am? <laughs> I left her house as quickly as I could. Her sister greeted me. Oh, Father, I'm so glad to see you. Well, if you weren't, I'd think that you were not my child. Your sister treated me with such unkindness, you'll never guess how mean she was to me. She said, I guess you mean she told you how she felt and you had trouble hearing it. I said, well, to hell with her. She said, no, listen, you are old. It's time for you to understand what's good for you in our eyes and face the fact that father may not know what's best. Go back to her and say you're sorry. Shall I bend down like this and pray to her? Dear daughter, I must confess that I am old. Age is unnecessary. On bended knees, I beg you, give me clothes and food and shelter. <laughs> Stop it! That's a stupid trick. Go back and live with her. I can't. I won't. She ordered me to fire half my men. Well, if that's what she said, then that's what you should do. And then she herself appeared. I was shocked. I didn't know she'd followed me. She came in and took her sister by the hand, and there they stood. Go back to her, and twenty men dismissed? No, I'd rather give up any shelter and choose to deal with all the elements. She smiled and said, that is your choice. I said, my choice is this. My forty men and I will stay here with your sister. But she said, not exactly. I'm not prepared for you and 40 men. Why can't you be satisfied with less, with 20? 
It's hard to have so many to control. Why can't you live with those we have? And let them serve you. If you find them slack, we'll take it on ourselves to fix the thing. The problem will be ours. It's now I see the truth. If you should come to me, I just would let you have ten men, no more, just ten. I gave you everything. And in good time, you gave it. I gave you everything I had, asked only that I live in style, and now you tell me that I can't, must humble out, must do with ten? Ask me again, and I'll repeat it. Ten. All right. I yield. I'll go back to your sister. Her twenty gives me twice as much as you. But then, she said, Listen, Father, what need have you for ten, or even five, to serve you in a house where we have plenty trained to serve your needs? Her sister echoed, What need one? Oh, reason not the need. Our poorest beggars are in the poorest things superfluous. Allow not nature more than nature needs. Man's life is cheap as beasts. Thou art a lady. If only to go warm were gorgeous, why nature needs not what thou gorgeous wears, which scarcely keeps thee warm. As for true need, oh, you heavens. Give me patience. Patience! I need. You gods, you see me here, a poor old man, as full of grief as age. Wretched in both, if it be you that stirs these daughters' hearts against their father, fool me not to take it tamely. Touch me with noble anger. And let not woman's weapons, water drops, stain my man's cheeks. No, oh, you unnatural hags. I'll have such revenges on you both. All the world shall... I shall do such things. What they are yet I know not, but they shall be the... Terrors of the earth, oh, you, you think I'll weep? No, I'll not weep. I have for course for weeping, but this heart shall break into a hundred thousand flaws or ere I weep. Oh, Bozo, I'll go mad. My caddy Bozo had been there with me. When I ran out of the house, he followed me onto the golf course, right outside the house. There had been a prophecy of hurricanes, and all the golfers had left the course, and it was empty, and I was empty, too. I felt less than nothing. Like those homeless men that I despised and feared. And now, what was inconceivable was real. And I was homeless, just like them. I, more stunned than angry, I felt asleep. I needed to wake up. I prayed. Blow winds. Crack your cheeks. Rage. Blow! You cataracts and hurricanos! Spout! 
till you have drenched our steeples, drowned the cocks. You, sulfurous and thought executing fires, vaunt couriers of oak cleaving thunderbolts, singe my white head! And thou, all shaking thunder, strike flat the thick rotundity of the earth, crack nature's molds, all Germans spill at once that make ungrateful man. Rumble thy belly full, spit fire, spout rain. <laughs> then, as if in answer to my prayer, the storm came on with heavy winds and rain. And before we knew what happened, we were drenched. Well, that woke me up. I laughed, and Bozo laughed. I turned and looked at him. I saw he was shivering. How now, my boy? How does my boy? I cold. I took my jacket off. I covered him. He looked at me with such astonishment, I understood how cold I'd been before. I mean, when I was warm and comfortable. It gave me quite a turn. Something in me stirred. I thought about the homeless once again. and with greater empathy. Poor naked wretches, wheresoever you are, that bide the pelting of this pitiless storm, how shall your houseless heads, your looped and windowed raggedness, defend you in seasons such as this? Oh, I've given too little care of this. Take physic, pump. Expose yourself to what poor wretches feel. That you may shake the superflux to them and show the heavens more just. Well, Bozo took me by the hand and led me to the caddy shack. The minute that he opened up the door, a crazy man inside began to scream at him and chased him out into the rain, and there he stood, a crazy, naked, homeless man. And my nightmare, or could it be he was a challenge sent by who knows what? Because I understood when he came out what I should do. I took off everything, my shoes, my pants, my shirt, my socks, my underwear, until I was as naked as I was at birth. And I felt calm, relaxed. <laughs> I felt whole. I mean, before then, that I wasn't whole. I had an inner life I never shared, and everything I did was in response to others, how I wanted them to see me, which went back, way back to those mean boys at school who called me Lear. It's what I used to save myself from them, to keep from being hurt, to make myself look big. Well, now I didn't care how big I looked. <laughs> That's when my crown came off for good, and I was king no more. A naked man, that's all I'd be, that's all I ever was. An accommodated man is no more but this poor bare fork animal. Yes, yes, yes. And now when I have nothing left to give, I see that what I gave before was nothing. It wasn't hard to give. It didn't satisfy my kids or me. And the irony behind my plan was that I wanted to be loved. But you can't show an armored man you love him. There's no place to put it. 
my youngest saw that. That's why she kissed my nose. It was as close as I would let her get. I saw the kid last night. I dreamt. She came here where I slept, leaned down and kissed my nose, and then she faded fast away. And you know it didn't hurt. <laughs> Well, when you're prepared for pain, it's not the same as when it comes and hits you. Bang! I want the world to know my name is Jake. Talked enough. There must be others that you want to see. <laughs>